Your briefing from John Thomas, the founding father of the international hedge fund industry, will begin momentarily. Hello, this is John Thomas, the mad hedge fund trader. Did you know the top three global stock markets in the first six months of 2010 were Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Venezuela? Or that Mongolia's stock market is up 100% in the last year? What's going on? It's simple. Jim O'Neill, Goldman Sachs analyst who came up with the BRIC concept a decade ago, is shifting Goldman's focus onto 11 frontier or pre-emerging markets, and oceans of hedge funds and other money are flooding into them. These countries are completely off the radar of regular investors, but in the next few years, you won't be able to shake a stick without hearing about them. It's no wonder, either. If you'd acted when Goldman Sachs announced the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, then you got in on the ground floor of some of the best trades in the last decade. China exploded 192%. Brazil shot up 376%. India handed investors up to 407% gains and Russia handed in a gobsmacking 1,107% gain. If you ignored this macro move, then you were likely stuck in the lost decade of the U.S., and you were losing money. First off, let me list these frontier markets for you, starting with the ones Goldman Sachs called the N11. They are Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, South Korea, Mexico, Nigeria, Pakistan, the Philippines, Turkey, and Vietnam. Others include Mongolia, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, the Ivory Coast, and Kuwait. So far this year, Frontier Funds have taken in $1.1 billion in new investment compared to the previous record of $443 million. The reason early stage investors are so excited about these countries are 1. They have emerging middle classes bursting onto the world economy, and I'll go into more about this in a moment. 2nd they're generating white-hot growth rates like Japan saw in the 1950s, Singapore saw in the 70s, and China is seeing today. But the most critical aspect of this for you as a trader or investor is to understand the forces driving these pre-emerging markets up, because once you do, then it becomes easier to play them for profit. As the guy who founded Wall Street's original international hedge fund and worked directly with Wall Street titans like Paul Tudor Jones, George Soros, and others, I can confidently tell you these macro trends are where to make the big money. So I want to break down the big macro trends every investor and trader needs to know about. I'm willing to wager that 99% of Main Street investors will continue missing out on these opportunities. And in case you're wondering how well this information translates to actually making money in the market, you should know that in 2010 alone, I've used these trends to lock in 48 winners and only one loser. And I'm not giving up on that one yet. I'll put these numbers up on the screen so you can see the global macro trading I do in my hedge fund is the smartest way for do-it-yourself investors or traders to make money in capital markets. You can see we have 12 winners in emerging markets with plenty of 30% and 50% gains in 5 months. There are 10 individual stocks, the big winner handing us 80% in the last 5 months, a 102% gain in commodities, some plump 14% gains in fixed income plays, and another 100% in precious metals. And thanks to nice little gains in currencies and food plays, we locked in 40%, 48%, 55%, 63%, and 87% among others in the past five months. Even better, we locked in 102% gains, 113%, and a mouth-watering 337% gain in metals. Again, this is all just in the last five months. My point is, if you know what to play and why, you can make serious money fast. 
Let me talk now for a while on the major long-term trends that I see affecting the financial markets for the next decade. Uh, for a start, there's the growth of the global population, the rise of the emerging market middle class, the scarcity of essential natural resources, the shift from paper assets to hard assets, uh, demographic investing and what is the implications of the silver tsunami and the rise of technology and of course a lot of these trends overlap each other cross each other uh, with different implications I'll start with global population growth because that's the easiest one to get a handle on it's also the most important trend uh, I call this the procreation trade uh, the willingness of people to procreate is something you can absolutely rely on. It's been going on for millions of years. It has entered its exponential growth phase, and there's really not much you can do to stop it. It's one of the reasons why, we're, why we are still around as humans. Uh, to understand why this is an important trend, you need to know who this guy is, the Reverend Thomas Malthus, who lived from 1766 to 1834. He is the father of modern demography. Uh, in a series of church sermons in the 18th century, he delivered the theory that uh, the growth of food supplies over time is linear, but the growth of human populations is ex exponential, and that it is only a matter of time before the human population outstrips the food supply. Uh, because of this, he believed that utopia is unattainable, uh, because of resource shortages that will bring famines, disease, and war. Uh, the Reverend Malthus's solution was virtuous behavior. Uh, I have a slightly different solution to this, and that is buy food supplies before they run up in price. Uh, history of the world in one page. Uh, during the time of the ancient Egyptians, there were only 10 million people in the world. Uh, that wouldn't even make a suburb in Shanghai today. Uh, by 1825, the population had grown to one billion, and then it really took off thanks to the Industrial Revolution. Today it's at seven billion, and by 2050, or in 40 years, the world population is expected to level out at about nine billion people. Now there are going to be some important changes in the makeup of the world population over the next 40 years, which will have a big impact on financial markets. We're going to be adding two billion new people. More than half of the increase will be in Islamic countries. The Islamic population will grow from one to two billion. Uh, this suggests to me, given that the largest increase will be in the most impoverished Islamic countries, that the war on terrorism isn't going to end in four years, and that you should uh, add that into your calculations. Uh, the current Pentagon budget is uh, only expecting the war on terrorism to last four more years. Uh, population levels will level off in Latin America, Africa, and China. Uh, in Latin America, families are going from seven children to two children in one generation. It took three generations for that to happen in the U.S. And 30 years ago, China adopted a one-child policy, which has cut the growth of its population by 400 million population is shrinking in Japan and it is level off to slightly shrinking in Europe. The US is in a slightly different situation. Its population will level off at 40 million, 400 million in by 2050 from the current 300 million. But the US has very active immigration unlike Japan and unlike uh, Europe and that immigration adds 1% a year of GDP growth. So scaring off immigrants isn't necessarily a good thing for our economic growth. Uh, if you add up uh, total growth projections for the world for the next 40 years, uh, the world is adding 175,000 new customers every day. Uh, and the game is to find what those customers want to buy. Uh, if you take the Malthusian theory of economics and apply it to commodities, um, this is roughly what you look like. You see the thin blue line is the world population growth, which 
suddenly uh, took off in 1825 and has been heading straight up ever since. But the growth of commodity supplies is a linear growth, much like we saw with food growth earlier. And what that means is eventually we run out of commodities uh, and enter a period of chronic hard asset or chronic resource and food shortages. We have had shortages in recent history. Uh, we saw them during World War II from 1939 to 45. We saw them during the first oil shock from 1973 to 82. Um, and again, it has started again in 2002. And in all of those instances, you saw huge increases in the prices of all commodities and foods. Uh, we are eight years into this, and I think this is a trend which will go on for decades to come. Uh, trading demographics uh, is another way to play the global markets. Um, this is the population pyramid, uh, a very useful tool that many international investors use for Vietnam for this year. And what this shows is the percentage of the population according to each age group split up in five-year increments. So if you look at the bottom here, you see there are large numbers of young people and small numbers of old people. This is an ideal country in which to invest uh, for that simple reason that rising populations create more consumers and the little need for social services means strong GDP growth, small budget deficits, and a strong currency. When you have a large number of young people supporting a small number of old people, that leads to good economic growth. And the, the many countries in the world that have this pyramid now are all seeing uh, economic growth rates of 5% a year or more. Um, this is the population pyramid for the United States, and it doesn't look so hot. Um, what this shows is you have a uh, shrinking number of young people supporting an ever larger number of old people. Uh, and as uh, an aging population and falling birth rate will bring you slower GDP growth, a growing demand for social services, rising budget deficits, and a weak currency, sort of like we're seeing in the United States right now. Uh, so this is the population of a country that has a mediocre growth outlook at best. Of course, it's a good thing we're not Japan. Uh, Japan currently has the world's worth, worst population pyramid. Uh, here are three pyramids for Japan. 1950, 2007, and 2050. Uh, you can see that 60 years ago, of course, they had a great pyramid. Uh, large numbers of young people, almost no old people, because the lifespan then was only 55. Um, today, it's sort of bulging at the middle. Um, few young people, few old people, and a lot of people in the middle. That's not such a big problem. The real problem is the outlook, the projection for what their country will look like in 40 years. And there you see huge numbers of old people, a very small number of young workers to support them. And what this gets you is two workers for every retiree, bringing no GDP growth, huge demands for social services and medical care, enormous budget deficits, and collapsing currencies. Uh, what do you do in this situation? Well, you short their currency, the Japanese yen, and you also short their bond market, uh, the Japanese government bond market, because it's just a matter of time before Japan has to start eating up its savings to support its uh, old people. Now, the rise of the emerging market middle class is probably the, the single most important trend that's affecting markets right now. In 1980, the global middle class was 580 million people. Thanks mostly to the growth of China, it's now 900 million. But you add 2 billion people, you add rising middle classes in India, China, Latin America, and other emerging markets, um, and you get a, uh, a, a total middle class of 2 billion people by 2050. 
So that means uh, more than a doubling of the current uh, class of consumers worldwide in 40 years. Um, in 1980, the U.S. exported uh, only 35% of its goods to emerging markets. Today, today that number is 54% and it's rising very quickly. Uh, the purchasing power of the middle class in emerging markets has also been rising quite sharply. Um, from 1975 to 2010, the per capita income in China rose from $100 per person to three thousand uh, dollars a year per person today and it's on its way to six thousand dollars per person that compares to a US standard of living which has dropped from fifty thousand dollars a year to forty six thousand uh, dollars now just in the last few years uh, to show you how rapidly uh, wages are growing in the emerging markets in the last thirty years South Korean wages rose from five percent uh, to 65 percent of the U.S. level in 30 years. So the big uh, picture view of what's happening here is that U.S. incomes are falling, uh, incomes in emerging markets are rising, therefore you want to buy companies that are selling to emerging markets and less to the U.S. So we have two kinds of assets in the world today, paper assets or hard assets. Which should we do? What will it be? Well, paper assets are stocks, bonds, derivatives, loans, notes, promissory notes, and basically anything that can be made with a printing press. The potential supply is infinite. All you have to do is flick a switch and you can make some more. You have several compete countries uh, around the world competing to print as much money as they can to uh, solve their economic problems, effectively creating a race to the bottom. And to that I add you know, the United States, Europe, Japan, even Brazil has started to print money. The problem is this creates huge inflationary risk down the road. Uh, we, have def we have to suffer the purgatory of deflation today uh, to get to the hell of inflation a few years into the future. That is going to be a major factor uh, dictating your investment decisions. Uh, both political parties in the United States are in a race with each other to inflate as much as they can. This is how they get reelected. So regardless of who's in uh, power in Washington, this is going to remain a big problem. And the net net of all of this is that I think the 30-year bull market in paper assets is over. Um, to make my case, take a look at this chart of the dollar, which goes back uh, 220 years. Uh, the do people complain about the dollar being weak now, but it's always been weak. Uh, sure, we've had good times and bad times, uh, but the long-term trend has been down. And it accelerated the downtrend uh, this in the last century. First of all, when you created the Federal Reserve in 1913, then when we went off the gold standard in 1932, uh, and then when our currencies were allowed to float against gold and other currencies in 1971. Uh, and since then, the downturn in the value of the dollar in terms of what it would purchase um, has been accelerating to the downside. So. A weak dollar is not a bad thing. And this, by the way, is how the United States has always paid off its de debts. It deflated the value of the dollar. Um, hard assets are in a completely different situation. Uh, it takes five years to bring a hard asset to market, to rip it out of a mine, to uh, extract it from the earth uh, is a very capital-intensive, labor-intensive, long-term project. It requires enormous amounts of money now to open new mines, uh, billions of dollars. Um, there are shortages of the equipment that you need to uh, develop these mines. Uh, look at this truck at an iron ore mill in Australia, iron ore mine in Australia. There's a three-year backlog to buy those tires, which cost over $100,000 each, and you can't mine the ore without them. 
our education system has failed to generate uh, sufficient numbers of engineers to develop new mines. The financial crisis froze all financing of new projects for two years, which is bringing forward peak demand in commodities all over the world. Uh, it created a bubble in the supply pipeline. Uh, we have environmental approvals, which are very difficult to get, especially in this country. That can drag out new projects for decades. Uh, infrastructure requirements for these projects are huge. And I'm talking about roads, pipelines, water, electric power. All this stuff has to be put in ahead of time before you get your f first uh, ounce of ore out. Uh, the commodity industry generally suffered from 25 years of underinvestment from 1980 to 2005 because prices were low. Uh, it only took the uh, price move that started in 2002 to get the ball rolling on new development. Uh, bottom line, uh, linear growth of commodities cannot meet the exponential demand that the emerging markets are creating. Now there are many kinds of hard asset classes. Uh, the obvious ones are precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. You have commodity producing foreign currencies, uh, the currencies of countries that are big resource exporters like Australia and Canada. Uh, energy is a good hard asset. Uh, peak oil is probably only five years away. You have natural gas, coal, uh, and uranium. Uh, remember there's a renaissance of nuclear power that's about to begin. Uh, other basic uh, raw materials, copper, iron ore, rare earths, titanium, zinc, and nickel are in demand. Food is a hard asset and that'll be great news for American farmers uh, because we are huge exporters of the foods uh, and that's corn, wheat, soybeans, fertilizer, and seeds. Water is a hard asset. Uh, I'm predicting that someday fresh water will become more valuable than oil. So there will be demand for water rights, water purification infrastructure, and so on. Real estate is a hard asset, um, and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, suffice to say, the only really interesting real estate plays right here are to buy agricultural land, especially in emerging markets and emerging market commercial real estate. And of course there are exchange traded funds for many of these things, uh, both the precious metals, uh, basic raw materials, and the uh, commodity producing currencies and countries. Um, gold. Peak gold is upon us. Um, it's rising to new highs almost every day. It's anticipating a return of high inflation uh, that uh, the relentless, relentless printing of money is bringing us. Production costs are rising. Uh, it's getting more expensive to produce gold. The number of mines are shrinking worldwide. Uh, Barrick Gold is not developing new mines at 15,000 feet in the Andes because it likes the fresh air. There's just nowhere else to go. Uh, the European Central Banks, after selling gold for 10 years, have stopped and have turned net buyers. Emerging market uh, central banks, in the meantime, have been buying for several years and are now engaged in a bidding war to drive the price of gold up. Uh, the rise of em the emerging market middle class is part of this because uh, the more uh, exchange reserves these countries accumulate, the more gold they want to buy. So it's a classic situation of a limited supply in a small market with increasing global demand. Uh, other precious metals, many of these arguments also apply. Uh, they include silver, platinum, and palladium. Uh, energy. Uh, I think peak oil is only five years off. Uh, the world economy is growing faster than its ability to develop new resources. Uh, the Gulf oil spill didn't help that situation at all by potentially taking a third of our oil supply off the market. Uh, coal is another uh, hard asset which will be in increasing demand. Uh, China is basically importing all the coal it can get from us. Uh, uranium, the nuclear industry I mentioned. Uh, China 
is building 100 new power nuclear power plants by 2020, and this is going to create huge uh, uh, upside uh, demand for both nuclear power equipment and also for uh, nuclear fuels, which is known as yellow cake. Natural gas, you want to stay away. We just found a 100 year supply through the new fracking technology. It's going to keep uh, prices low for a decade. Uh, raw materials, basic raw materials, you have iron ore, copper, rare earths, aluminum, lumber, zinc, and nickel. Uh, demand is increasing for all of these. Uh, food. Um, we are setting up for another crisis in food. You may have noticed that food prices are up quite substantially this year. In the case of wheat, it's doubled. Corn is up about 30, 30 or 40 percent. Uh, and this is going to continue. Um, one of the aspects of the rising uh, emerging market middle class is they want to eat. They want to eat more food. They want to eat better food. So people in China are shifting from eating just rice to eating more pork, more eggs, more beef. Uh, this creates demand for everything. Uh, to grow one pound of beef requires 16 pounds of grain. So the higher the quality of food you're eating, the more the global demand for food becomes. Water is another hard asset. Uh, only. Two and a half percent of the world's water is fresh, three quarters of that is locked up in ice. Uh, the world's most populated country, China, 90 percent of the water is polluted. Some of it is so polluted it can never be purified. Uh, water tables in India and China, uh, India and the U.S. are falling to historic lows. Uh, some countries are resorting to purifying uh, seawater through salinization but that increases the cost of the water 10 times. Uh, and the one pound of beef that required 16 pounds of grain to create requires 2,416 gallons of water. Uh, that is going to create huge demands for clean water, which we are running out of. Some 18 percent of the world population lacks access to potable water today, and that is expected to rise to 40 percent over the next 20 years. So this will be another major long-term play in the markets. Uh, this is a satellite view of the uh, Indian water table, one of the largest food growing areas in the world, showing uh, how much their water table has declined in the last eight years. Um, commodity producing currencies are something dear to my heart. If a country uh, is producing commodities, the price for those commodities is going up, demand is going up. The currencies of those countries also go up, and Australia is a perfect example of that. They are uh, exporting immense amounts of uh, copper, copper, iron ore, coal, and food to China. Uh, the uh, iron ore exports alone are expected to reach a hundred billion dollars this year. And this is for a country that only has 25 million people. So that money feeds directly into the value of the currency, which has really been appreciating all year. Uh, same for the Australian stock market. Um, you know, you've had a bull market in, in uh, Australian stocks because that money gets recycled into their paper assets, which make them go up. Uh, you can make the same arguments also for Canada, which has a broad range of commodities to export, uh, and Russia, which is uh, the world's largest oil exporter. Uh, the one real estate, uh, the one hard asset you don't want to own is real estate, especially residential real estate. And since most of you own your own homes, I'll go into why you can't count on it to go up in price in the foreseeable future. Uh, and the big problem is the um, retirement of the baby boomers. I think we're going to see a replay of the zero return that real estate uh, brought us in the United States from 1929 to 55. Um, the problem is the silver tsunami. 80 million baby boomers are retiring uh, at the rate of 10,000 a day. This means Social Security will turn cash flow negative by 2017 and completely run out of uh, money by 2040, 2041. 
the generation that follows the baby boomers are the Gen Xers, and there are only 65 million of those. So um, there aren't enough people in the next generation to buy the parents of the baby boomers, which means a huge oversupply of housing that will last a generation. Uh, where do baby boomers live? Well, um, they started out in nice single-family homes, raised their kids, retired, moved to a condo, got old, and uh, ended up in an assisted living facility. Uh, that all means downsizing from a 2,500 square foot house to a 100 square foot room. If you add up the total drag on the real estate market that the baby boomers represent, it equates to 4.3 billion square feet uh, of market every year for 22 years, which equal 430 World Trade Centers. That is how much excess real estate the uh, baby boomer generation is creating. What does the market look like today? Well, we have a million new homes on the market that have been built by the uh, home builders. We have four million secondary homes, used homes, on the market, and the banks have another million that they got on foreclosure. According to a survey by Zillow.com, 20 million homeowners will sell on any improvement in the market. That takes us up to 26 million homes, either now on the market or potentially on the market, versus an actual annual demand of houses of 4.9 million units. That's five years of inventory. So one out of a five uh, American homes is for sale or about to hit the market. Um, these are the people who are not buying homes right now. There are 35 million unemployed, uh, including those that, uh, whose benefits expired, which is the broader definition of unemployment, and expired worker. They're not buying houses anytime soon. The 35 million who have negative equity are not going to be buying homes anytime soon because they either have to declare bankruptcy or uh, uh, put cash into a transaction to get it to close. And needless to say, the damage to their credit ratings is huge when this happens. This means we have 70 million missing buyers out of a total U.S. home market of 140 million homes. That's half the market. Uh, so the best case uh, scenario for homes is a long grind sideways at current levels. The worst case is another 20% uh, down leg in real estate prices that triggers a secondary banking crisis. If you wonder why uh, uh, bank shares have not uh, matched the rest of the market with the latest upturn, that's the reason. And this is the uh, S&P Case-Shiller composite home index showing prices for the last 10 years and uh, after the bubble popped we had a huge drop and we seem to be grinding around sideways here. If you're really interested in profiting from these trends and opportunities I'm happy to let you follow my specific trades as I make them in the market. I run a global long short portfolio where the goal is to find the best investments in the world and the worst investments in the world. We go long the good ones and short the bad ones. Over time, the longs go up and the shorts go down and we make money no matter what the markets are doing. My approach to the market has evolved over the last four decades and has proven highly successful in all market conditions. I look at stocks, bonds, foreign currencies, commodities, precious metals, and real estate. I look at sectors across markets, across instruments, and across international borders. The emphasis is to make absolute returns in all market conditions. I'm not worried about beating a benchmark like the S&P 500. I actually want to make money off my investments. So I use aggressive risk control through dynamic hedging. As some of our securities run up, we take some money off the table and hedge with options. The same is true on the downside with our shorts. And yes, this is absolutely something you can execute as a do-it-yourself investor and trader at home. The instruments we use include common stocks, options, futures contracts on the major exchanges, convertible bonds, 
closed end mutual funds, exchange traded funds or ETFs, foreign currencies, and bonds of every description, including government bonds, corporate bonds, and bonds issued by foreign governments. And the tools we use include the traditional fundamental research, technical analysis, and quantitative analysis, which involves a mathematical approach to the markets. We look at the flow of funds of major institutional investors, always looking to follow the money and, if possible, get ahead of the money. And, of course, I use a 40-year network of global contacts that I have built up throughout my career.